Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be fixing something that is becoming a more common issue as time goes on with the original Xbox, and that is trace rot. More specifically, trace rot that is causing the front power and disk tray buttons to work intermittently or not at all. I present to you Exhibit A, where I have an Xbox with this exact issue. The disk tray opens and closes by pressing the eject button without any issues. But when we try to turn the system off, nothing happens. Now this is a pretty clean Xbox unit. Sometimes if they're not as cared for or have been in a smoking environment for a long time, there can be issues with these buttons. This is fixed with some deep cleaning of the button membranes, but since this is a clean unit, it most likely has a motherboard trace that is broken. So let's jump into fixing this issue and get it back up and working like it should be once again. But before we get into that, here are some of the tools you'll need to finish the job. Soldering for this is a must, and if you're new to small scale soldering, you may want to practice on some other boards before trying this on your own original Xbox. You'll need some small gauge wire to patch the broken traces. I'm using 30 gauge coated magnet wire for this. You'll also most likely need a multimeter to test continuity of your traces. Sometimes you can see the breaks, but it's best to test before and after you patch just to make sure that you have it all together correctly. A pair of side cutters for trimming the wire or a knife. Some tweezers can be helpful for holding the wire in place during soldering. Some cleaning supplies and some kept on tape to hold the patch wires in place to make sure that they don't move around after installation. And last but not least, you'll need some Torx T10 and T20 screwdriver bits for opening the case and removing the internal screws. But once you have everything gathered, start by opening up your Xbox from the bottom. Remove all six T20 hidden screws there and flip it over to remove the lid. I've already removed these, but there are another three T10 screws holding the hard drive and disk drive in place inside as well. Then it's just a process of taking everything else out so we can get down to the motherboard. The main IDE ribbon cable needs to be removed from the hard drive and disk drive as well. The power cable for the disk drive and the IDE cable can be removed from the motherboard shortly after too. I'm working on a 1.0 version Xbox for this example, so there are two separate fans. The case fan all the way in the back needs to be removed, but the heatsink fan can stay in place. After that, the main power connection is next. This is towards the front and is typically tough to remove on these 1.0 units. Just be careful to remove it slowly so none of the wires are pulled from the connector. Then the controller port connections and front button panel connector can be removed next before removing all of the T10 screws holding the motherboard in place. The number of screws vary depending on the version of the Xbox you have, but remember to remove all of the wire connections first before removing the screws. This way the board will stay in place and not flex as much while pulling the connectors out of position, especially with the main power connector. Once the screws are out, pull up on the front edge of the motherboard and slide it towards you to get it out of the way of the other connectors and wires. You now have the motherboard free and can start testing it. As you can see, this motherboard is pretty clean, so please remember trace rot doesn't only happen when it's dirty inside. Now flip the board over so the heatsink is facing down and the front edge of the board is still facing you. The main traces we'll be looking at are on the front traveling up the right edge of the board. There are four in particular that we will be testing that affect the operation of the front two buttons. You can wipe these with a q-tip and some alcohol to see if you can see any visible voids, but many times it's tough to see and requires testing to determine the specific patches needed. In this case, there's a small void that can be seen in the corner of the first trace line on the board. To test yours, you'll need to find the small oval-shaped hole about a third of the way from the far left side of the board. Follow that down to the resistors just below it. This is where the beginning of the four traces start. The lone small via under the label R3V4 on this board is the connection to the first trace that runs the length of the front and the right side of the board. The second via to the right is the next, followed by the third point which is the right side of the resistor further to the right, and the fourth point which is another resistor directly above the third. If your eyes can follow them, you can see that these are the first four traces on the board leading out to the right. These lead halfway up to the small test points on the far right side of the board. The first trace's endpoint is the highest in this set of three, followed by the second and the third trace endpoints. The final fourth test point is further up on the left, right next to the label C7P9 on this board. These are the trace runs for the front buttons and we can test them as follows. Turn your multimeter on to continuity mode, which typically has these symbols. Then probe each set of these points to see which are connected. 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, 4 to 4. With this example, the first trace doesn't sound and is broken. But the second, third, and fourth traces are all good and we don't have any issues. Now that we've found this issue, how do we fix it? 
We could patch the small void that can be seen in the front of the trace, but it's difficult to attach wires to such a small location. And if that trace run is already having issues, it might be better to bypass it completely anyway. So I'm going to be running a patch wire between both of these test points instead. I start by scraping the top of the VO with a sharp knife to make sure there's a solid connection point to solder to. Then add some flux to the area and the magnet wire that I also scratched a little bit of the coating away from on the end too. Touch the tip of your soldering iron to some solder and hold the wire in place while applying the solder to the via. With the size of the wire that I'm using, you can feel the hole where the via is and I stick it into that spot directly. This way the solder coats the area around the wire and the via. You should be able to tug on it lightly after you're done without it pulling away from the board too. If it pulls away, just reheat and reattach it. Clean the area to remove any excess flux and begin running the wire to the other point on the right. You can follow the original trace if you'd like, but I like to go straight up and over. Trim the end of the wire long and repeat the process at the end point. Scrape the end of the wire to remove the coating. Add flux to the point that you're going to be soldering to. And hold the wire in place while touching off with the tip of your iron that's already got a small amount of solder on it. If you're not happy with the placement, just touch it again with your iron and adjust the wire until it's set in a better position. Then clean up when you're done so it can be tested with a multimeter to confirm the connection is good. If not, check to make sure that the wire is in the right location or reheat and reattach the ends to the two test points. This patch tested well and I can move on to securing the wire in place next. I'm using Kapton tape for this since it's meant for use with electronics. I like to go over each of the bends first and then cover in between so there's nothing hanging loose that can be snagged during reassembly. If you have multiple broken traces, it may be a good idea to use different wire colors or route the wires in different locations so they just don't touch or rub after this. But partially reassemble the unit back in the reverse order that you did before. The good news is it doesn't need to be fully put together with all of the screws and the lid in order to test the front buttons too. So once a few screws are in place to prevent the motherboard from moving, you can then add in all the cables and drives to test it out with some power on your TV. As expected, this unit works great and now has both of its front buttons working again too. Once I was done testing, I reassembled this unit fully and did one more test just to make sure that everything was working, and as expected, it had no other issues. I hope this helped you fix your own console, and if you're looking for other guides on fixing more issues, be sure to check out my channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next fix.